Welcome to my channel, INTJ Island. Today, I'm going to discuss the INTJ growing up. I did a video on this topic three years ago, but it was overwhelmed by inadequately trained artificial intelligence, and its comments were cut off, and it was set off to the land of limited access for sponsors. I think that was because I used a visual screen for the entire video that held a 60-year-old picture of myself when I was in first grade. That confused their bots, I fear, thinking it was either made by a child or was made for a much younger audience than anyone who would have listened to it. So I will try another approach this time. It is a topic that I think is very important to INTJs, and I'm fairly sure that we all went through something along these lines in our past. I learned pretty quickly in school that I was different from most of the other kids, and it was difficult for me to understand why. It wasn't easy for this introvert to make sense of the extroverted world. I spent a large portion of my childhood alone. Sometimes I was alone in my room or in my yard doing things that I could do all by myself. Even in the classroom, I usually felt alone, sitting at my desk that was located as far from the noisy center of extroverted action as I could manage. I had some acquaintances who lived in my neighborhood, and we did play together. In the summertime, as often as I could, I'd go with a group of the local boys over to the school to play baseball. But at school, or in the neighborhood, I seldom had more than one really close friend, and there were times when I didn't even have that. For the introvert, there is a wonderful feeling of peace that comes from solitude. That time alone is healthy time, time to gather your inner thoughts together and to enjoy them. It is the grain of sand being isolated within the clam that creates a pearl. And the time I spent alone as a child did a lot towards making me who I am today. Every year, I watch the movie Miracle on 34th Street with Natalie Wood. Natalie played Susan Walker, a precocious little girl in the second grade. She is self-contained, and her reaction to the other kids was that she felt they were silly, and she chose not to play with them because she decided to be by herself instead, rejecting their games. When Kris Kringle, a man who thought he was really Santa Claus, heard this, he suggested that Susan should have joined in with the others, and he didn't think that the other children were being silly. Susan who very likely was an INTJ, was a mystery to him, because he loved people. And like a good Santa Claus, he especially loved children. We learn from the discussion between Susan and Chris that Susan was a loner. The other kids were a group apart from her, and she had no problem with walking away from them. She was not sorrowful about this separation. She was confused by the kids' behavior, but perfectly happy being apart from the group. I doubt there is a single INTJ who didn't have this very feeling many times while growing up. As Chris and Susan talked, she was intellectually interacting with him one-on-one. -on -one. Emotions were in the background, locked up where they belonged. She was obviously a person who needed to be reasoned with, and he was wise enough to see that. And he reasoned with her. She did not run away from his new ideas. In fact, she soaked them up like a sponge. She engaged in the discussion, and even as young as she was, she attempted to analyze things and understand what went on behind the scenes. There were several other places in the movie where Susan did her best to think her way through, to arrive at a logical conclusion. Chris taught Susan a new skill, how to mimic the behavior of a monkey, and she jumped into the task with gusto. It was an especially suited task, because once she got the basics, she could go off by herself and practice it with a mirror until she got it right. But like most INTJs, she was motivated by the task, apparently not at all concerned with how this would affect the other kids. While Chris assumed that she would use what he taught her to be part of the other kids' menagerie, Susan never said that she was going to use this new skill in that fashion. She displayed no joy over the thought of joining in with the other kids and she never indicated that she was going to play their games in the future. And here is something else that INTJs can relate to. Susan made evidence-based evaluations of answers to questions. She was, in fact, the only one, other than the judge, who demanded proof of who Santa Claus was before she would accept him. And here is the key point. Once she had the evidence in hand, she believed instantly. 
Prior to that, she kept an open mind and would have been content to come down on either side of the question put to her, is Kris Kringle Santa Claus? Belief seemed far-fetched to her, but she told herself that belief was possible. Silly, mind you, but possible. And then, when she had what she considered to be sufficient supportive evidence, she acted just like an INTJ, as she embraced it as a fact. Even her mom and Uncle Fred didn't really believe Chris was Santa Claus at that point. But little Susan was walking her own intellectual, introverted path, and she knew, because she had what she felt was solid evidence, that Chris Kringle was really Santa Claus. INTJs are not always right, but they often are because they look at the data and compare it with valid patterns in their minds. And if the evidence shows that answer A is correct, we go with answer A, even if all the rest of the world says that answer B is correct. Susan didn't care if anyone else was convinced of Chris Kringle's identity. She never even bothered to ask anyone else. She worked it out on her own. A final point on this example. Susan was very excited when she found the house and inspected it. But never once did she mention how she was going to have friends over to her new house. Her mother was excited about that, but not Susan. Susan ran upstairs and checked her room to see if she would be comfortable spending time there. And then she checked the backyard to see if it had what she wanted, a swing. She saw it was all good and she was very happy about that. Her emotions were evident, but they were brought on by finding something that she had wanted for a long time, the house, and thereby also finding the evidence she was seeking that told her that Chris was really Santa Claus. Those who don't understand INTJs might see this as being egocentric or even narcissistic. It seems to them that she apparently only cared about herself, but that was not what was going on. Susan was focused on the things that mattered to her intellectually, but throughout the movie she was a loving daughter to her mother and a caring friend to the adults around her. It is also no aberration that her friends were adults. She really did think that the kids were being silly in their little world of make-believe. At the house, Susan never said anything about the fact that, by moving here, she would have to leave her friends behind, or suggested that she would miss them. She was happy to be moving to a place that would make her solitary existence more comfortable. She would probably find a new friend, but it was not her primary focus, and she didn't bother to mention it. What can a parent offer to a child like Susan? Susan needed to be loved, just as any child does. Her mother was very important to Susan. Engaging in interesting talks with Uncle Fred and Chris Kringle were important to her as well. She was open to speaking with a serious mind and enjoying the process as it occurred. An INTJ is trying to understand the world around him. He wants knowledge, and he wants things to make sense. An INTJ is eager to talk about important things that will help his understanding. However, dealing with the childhood equivalent of small talk can leave an INTJ child feeling apathetic. While he may play with the other kids, and even have fun doing so up to a point, he will need to pull back into his own space regularly to regroup. But there can be pain as well. INTJs only make up 2% of the population in the United States. That means if you have a group of 50 people, there will, on average, only be one INTJ within it. There may be no INTJs. If you take a classroom with 30 or 40 kids in it, how many INTJs will be there? If you are one of them, as I was, you are all alone. None of the others in your class are like you. What you want from others is respect, to be treated with dignity, as you would treat them. You don't bully them into being like you, but sadly, very often, they are happy to bully you for being different. Even worse, you find that adults assume that something is wrong with you for being a loner, and they want you to socialize more. Every day you are stuck in a classroom with people who are noisy and pushy and people who seem to be shallow, and sometimes they are cruel to you. But even with all of that, you are called out for not wanting more of this abuse. If an INTJ child doesn't have a good mentor, someone who understands that he is not broken but only gifted, he can feel that he is not at all validated as a person. He is not okay. The kids pick on him and he is told that he needs to be more like them. This is illogical, 
and an INTJ child needs for things to be logical. But we are not born omniscient, and we have to learn what is going on for ourselves. Therefore, as a child, it is hard to realize that you just might be right, even when adults might be wrong. I look back to my own childhood, and I shudder at all the things that could have been so much better, but weren't. When I was in seventh grade, my family moved to a new town and a new school, and for one semester, I caught my first glimpse of what it was like to have a really good teacher. Mr. Nicholas was my intellectual Santa Claus, because he showed me what school should be like. He looked at me as being gifted rather than weird, and under his direction, I went from being a failing student to an A student almost instantly. He asked me once, didn't they like you at your other school? He was shocked by how poorly I had done before. The fact was that no one had much cared how I did, even me. For all I knew, I was too stupid to learn what they were trying to force down my throat. But moving to the new school was like turning on the light in a pitch-dark room where I had been stumbling over the furniture that others had arranged around me. And suddenly, school knowledge came alive, and I was breezing through my classes with ease. My father was utterly shocked when he saw all those A's on my first report card. It was like he had never seen me before. No one had ever really seen me before. Sadly, Mr. Nicholas was gone the next year, and the only other teacher who could match him in my future was my math teacher for four years in high school. A rational child who loves to read and think should be every parent's desire. Such a child could be a friend and sometimes would bring something to even adult-level problems with insights others might miss. Unfortunately, a lot of INTJ children are thought of as being dysfunctional, and they are viewed as if they needed to be fixed. The way many parents treat their introverted child is like they found oil on their property, but instead of celebrating and becoming rich, they cover it up, trying to make it appear as though the oil didn't exist. Since I have already mentioned one old movie, I will mention another one of my favorites, No Highway in the Sky, with Jimmy Stewart. He played a scientist named Theodore Honey. He had a daughter named Elspeth, played by Janet Scott, and she was amazing. Theodore was brilliant and absent-minded. Elspeth was also brilliant and introverted to the bone. The two of them shared a world of brain puzzles and knowledge, and they were happy together. But then something unexpected happened, and Elspeth was suddenly accepted by her classmates at school. She found that she enjoyed being accepted after being a complete outsider for so long. But when it ended, reality crashed down upon her, and she was horribly crushed. She was crying uncontrollably to her father about the impermanence of things. The poor man was lost as to how to comfort his little introvert. It is one of the most touching scenes I have ever seen in a movie, probably because I could relate to both the father and the child, who were both out of their depth as they tried to deal with emotions when thinking was their world. The others in the movie were completely lost in trying to understand how the minds of Theodore and Elspeth worked. Even at the end, the wonderful extrovert Marjorie Corder, played magnificently by Glennis Johns, made the decision that she was going to marry Theodore and watch over the introverted family, which would have been lost without her. I worry about how Marjorie would fare in such a home. But having lived most of my life with a very strongly extroverted ESTP, I think the three of them would be able to create a happy home together. She might get lost when Theodore and Elspeth got into a deep discussion about the mathematical relationships contained in the Great Pyramid Dimensions and its placement relative to the orientation of the Earth's rotation, or when they were playing one of their exciting mental games with each other. But she would open up a lot of new things to them as well. It is important to remember that there is nothing inherently wrong with any personality type. It is not a moral or ethical question whether you are extroverted or introverted, any more than with the question of your being left or right-handed. You are who you are, and who you are is okay. What is an ethical question, however, is how you treat others. If you treat an introverted child as though he is broken and needs fixing, you will create a dilemma within him. You are setting up roadblocks to his achieving a comfortable, rational connection with his universe and healthy relationships with those around him. 
An INTJ wants things to make sense. He can have conflicting ideas in his mind simultaneously because he can place his assessment on hold as he searches for more facts so he can properly evaluate the ideas. It happens all the time. It is normal routine inside of my brain. What many other types of people don't understand is that there can be true joy in pulling facts together and making them work inside a model. The Earth goes around the Sun. The Sun is part of the Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy is one of the galaxies in our local cluster of galaxies, and so on. The universe is made up of things we know and things we don't know. And for an INTJ, to move something from the don't know column over to the know column literally brings joy to his heart. Fortunately, the introvert can be a lot tougher than people think he is. We have to be. We grow up in a world that doesn't like introversion. The world calls us names like shy or antisocial. The kids in school call us far worse names. How does an introvert react to this unfair state of affairs? He will tend to draw away from others to avoid the nasty treatment. The extroverted adults will find this to be objectionable. For some reason, teachers and parents never view the bad treatment that introverts get from the other children as being as unacceptable as they view our trying to avoid it. This was what I found in school, and I'm sure many other INTJs have found it as well. As we get older, we grow barbs and quills that hold off the attacks. We become the masters of sarcasm and the intellectual insult. It is a time of transition or coming of age when an INTJ realizes finally that there is nothing wrong with him. There is room for growth always, but that is what he does best. He is always looking for directions where he can grow. If others will simply refrain from trying to make him into an ESTP or an ESFP, Accepting who we are makes it far easier to accept others for who they are. The INTJ, like Elon Musk, can flourish, just like the ESFP, Elvis Presley, who is known as the king. The contributions from these different types will be different as well, but they are all significant. We can't all be great scientists. There are many roles to fill in a society. What extroverted parents and teachers need to understand is that a child is not inferior or broken when he is introverted. If he prefers to read rather than going to a party, it is not dysfunctional behavior. It is his natural preference. It is okay. If she prefers to listen to Mozart while writing a short story, to watching TV or going to a slumber party, she is okay. If your son or daughter is an introvert, Take this gifted child by the hand, please, and lead the child forward to high self-esteem. An INTJ will walk his own path no matter what you do, but you can make it seem like an amazing hike through a beautiful landscape, or you can force him into fighting his way through a dark valley. Either way, he will be walking his own path, but if you choose, you can help him to accomplish the great things that he would naturally reach for. Engage with your little INTJ, open doors for him rather than blocking them, and you will find that you not only will have a healthy, happy INTJ child, but a friend for the rest of your life. For the younger INTJ, as you grow strong in your self-confidence, try to avoid the pitfall of arrogance. When you have had years of abuse from people calling you names and laughing at you, it is easy to look down on them as morons and being beneath you but that is letting them set your agenda for you. You set your actions. You decide what you will do. Don't hand this priceless freedom to others, especially those who have treated you badly. You and you alone will decide who you are going to be. As you grow up, if you are an INTJ, you will find your path and you will walk it. If you are lucky, you will have parents who will help you do that. If you are not so fortunate, do not despair. Today is not all there is. Your mind is set on the future, and if you embrace that and hold true to yourself, you will step out from under the clouds of misunderstanding into the bright sunlight of your self-directed life. Your friends will be few, but they will be awesome. And be confident that you will be awesome too. If you enjoyed the video, please click like. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. 
If you click on the bell, you will also receive notifications when I put up a new video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.